Now we'd like to try an example where we have an actual formula for the function. So in this case, let's suppose that an object's vertical velocity is f of t equals t squared meters per second. So maybe this is a hummingbird like we talked about in an earlier example way back. How far does it travel on the interval from 0 to 2? So again, this is the opposite, the inverse problem of what we were doing before. There we were given the object's position. We wanted to find out how fast it was going, its rate of change. Now we're given the rate of change. We want to figure out how far it traveled. So as a first try, we're going to build on what we already know how to do, namely use a Riemann sum. So just for convenience, let's suppose that we use four subdivisions again. We want to figure out what our delta t is. Well, our interval is two units long, two minus zero units divided into four pieces should be one half. So my t value should be zero, one half, one, one quarter, and two. So now let's figure out what the object's velocity is at each of these points. We just plug these into the formula up here. So at time zero, the velocity is zero meters per second. At time one half, it's a quarter meter per second. Then one meter per second. This shouldn't say one quarter here, should it? This should probably say one and a half, three halves. So then we're going nine quarters of a meter per second. And then we finish out the interval going four meters per second. So we can do a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum just as we did before. So for the left-hand sum, when I have the choice between the value at time zero and time one-half, which one should I be picking? The value at time zero or the value at time one-half? Since it's the left-hand sum, we pick the one on the left. So we're there we're going to be picking f of zero times delta t. So that's zero, and my delta t is one-half. And then the next interval, I have the choice between the value at 1 half and the value at 1. So we choose the value at 1 half. And we just keep going, always choosing the left end point of each subinterval. And again, as we mentioned in the previous segment, you should be asking yourself, is this left-hand sum going to be an overestimate or an underestimate now? Remember, in the last example, the left-hand sum was an overestimate. So we're going to get 0 times 1 half and 1 quarter times 1 half, and 1 times 1 half, and 9 fourths times 1 half. And this should add up to 1.75 meters. So one estimate is that the bird or whatever it was traveled 1.75 meters. That's the left-hand estimate. Let's try the right-hand sum. The right-hand sum, in our first interval where we have the choice between the value at 0 or the value at 1 half, since it's the right-hand sum, we pick the value at 1 half. So there we're starting with f of 1 half delta t. And then we just go from there, f of 1, f of 3 halves, and we end with f of 2. So let's note one more time, because we're going to use this later, that the first term in the left-hand sum is the only one that doesn't appear in the right-hand sum. The last term in the right-hand sum is the only one that doesn't appear in the left-hand sum. So if I subtract one from the other, It'll be this term remaining from the right-hand sum, this term remaining from the left-hand sum. So now let's fill in the values here. f of a half is a quarter. Delta t is still a half. f of 1 is 1. f of 3 quarters is 9 halves. f of 2 is 4. You add those all up, you get 3.75 meters. So in this case, it was the left-hand sum that was the smaller of the two. So what's the difference? In the first example that we did, the function, the rate of change was a decreasing function. In this example, the rate of change is an increasing function. And that's what makes the difference. If you have an increasing function, values on the right are bigger than values on the left. So if f is an increasing function, the right-hand sum will be bigger than the left-hand sum. If f is a decreasing function, as it was in our oil take example, then the left-hand sum will be bigger than the right-hand sum. That's what it comes down to. Just as we did when we were doing the instantaneous rate of change, we'd like to look at this graphically now. I'm going to do the right-hand sum first. Remember when we did the product rule and we talked about how multiplying can be represented by a certain geometric shape? Remember what that geometric shape was? It was a rectangle, right? So if we think about this first term here, f of 1 half, that means we went over to t equals 1 half and we figured out the height. So that height there was a quarter. And we multiplied by delta t, that was this distance here, 1 half. So the area of that rectangle is the same as saying 1 quarter times 1 half. So this answer of 1 eighth meter, which is the most the object could have traveled in the first half of a second, an eighth of a meter, the area of this rectangle is 1 eighth. And we did the same thing at t equals 1. We went over to t equals 1, we found out the height of the function, 
and we multiplied that by 1 half. We did the same thing at t equals 3 halves, and we did the same thing at t equals 2. So the area of these rectangles added up is 3.75. In fact, it's 3.75 meters. Now, you might say, I've never seen an area measured in meters before. Why is this measured in meters? Well, what are the units on the function f of t up here? Its units are meters per second. And what are the units on t down here? Its units are seconds. So in each of these cases, we're taking a vertical distance measured in meters per second times a horizontal one measured in seconds. And when you multiply meters per second times seconds, you just get meters. So it might sound a little funny to say that the area is 3.75 meters, and maybe we're using the word area a little bit more broadly than we should, but this does represent 3.75 meters. In the left-hand sum, the first value that we chose was f of 0. Well, an f of 0 was 0. So we're basically drawing a rectangle with no height. Technically, that is a rectangle. It's called a degenerate rectangle is the official math language for that. But hard for me to draw on the board, so I'm just going to draw a horizontal line there. Then at time 1 half, we took the value, which was a quarter, and we multiplied it by a half, and we just kept going. So I think graphically you can start to see why in this case the right-hand sum is an overestimate and the left-hand sum is an underestimate. So here also the area will be, not also, here the area will be 1.75 meters. Now of course the question is how can we get a better estimate? So if you wanted to get a better estimate, you might use 8 subdivisions, or 12, or 16, or 100. And if you want to get the exact estimate, what would you need to do? Not the exact estimate, the exact value of how far the object actually did travel as an exact number. Think back to what we did for differential calculus, how, what mathematical process we needed to use to get the exact re instantaneous rate of change. It's the same one we're going to be using here. I cannot draw these rectangles, more and more of them, very well, but we have an applet for you where you can explore on this function and any other, any other function you choose, changing the value of n, and you can see really nice, it's a very good applet, how uh, the areas change. So try to compare the left-hand sum and the right-hand sum as you make n bigger and bigger and bigger. Maybe try to even come up with a guess on your own for what you think the exact distance that the object travels is, and then we'll come back and talk about more about how to figure that out.